Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, very, very gratifying. I, I wasn't sure how many people we'd, we'd have, but uh, I see we've got all, all uh, uh, generations represented, it looks like here. So I, I especially wanted to, uh, to uh, present this to the, the next generation because uh, uh, they're, they're gonna be in charge and, and it's gonna be up to them to do, uh, do the right thing. Uh, I, I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, some, some people. Uh, first was, uh, was Dave Houle from our uh, technology department. Uh, Dave helped uh, an awful lot putting this PowerPoint together. The second is my good friend and colleague, uh, John Little from uh, Northern Essex Community College, retired, who has uh, provided me with enormous amounts of research, uh, has basically devoted his life to the subject of the uh, the assassin assassination of John F. Kennedy. And also to Sandy uh, Carricker, the, uh, the chair of our emeriti group, who uh, has, has given me uh, much in the way of advice and uh, assistance in this, this project as well. Um, so we, we only have an hour and 15 minutes. I, I really need a couple of hours at least, you know, to do a decent job on this, but I'm going to do my best. You'll have to excuse me for running through some of the some of the material rapidly. It's the only way I'm I'm, I'm going to get through everything. Uh, and uh, um, oh, I have a packet. I wanted to mention a packet of documents for everyone here. Uh, if if you want one, uh, I think I've got, there are about 20, 25 pages uh, in in total. And they come from the book uh, Regicide that I'll be talking about uh, a little later, uh, which I think is the, the, the most important uh, work that's, uh, that's arrived to date on the, uh, on the scene uh, regarding the assassination. And, and most importantly, uh, who, why, and how the assassination uh, uh, took place. Uh, so, uh, let me see, what else did I have to, uh, to, to mention? Uh, so I, I think uh, I'll just, just take it from there and start with our first PowerPoint, which is uh, why is the assassination of John F. Kennedy uh, important? Let me say in the beginning that uh, I, ha I have some bias on the subject of uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, I met John F. Kennedy when I was seven years old uh, in 1946 on the campaign trail with my father. My father was Kennedy's first uh, Republican opponent for Congress uh, in that year, and my father uh, accused him of being uh, soft on communism, uh, which of course he was not. But uh, that, that's a charge that uh, has resurfaced during the Kennedy administration and I think was, uh, to a great extent, uh, responsible for his demise. Uh, so JFK uh, was one of our greatest presidents. Um, that, that what, what is most important about uh, President Kennedy is the fact that he, he was able to change, and, and he did change incredibly. There's really two Kennedys. There's a Kennedy uh, who was uh, in office before becoming president in the Congress and then in the Senate, and in his first, first uh, year uh, of, of his presidency. And then this is the Kennedy that uh, became transformed, I think, by, by the events uh, around him, who came to realize that uh, the path we were on was, was mis a mistaken one, and that uh, significant uh, uh, changes had to be made in how we approached uh, the, the problems of, of that, uh, of that uh, time. Uh, Kennedy uh, was able to uh, examine, assess, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, change uh, positions and for, for, the, for the better. Uh, and and that's, that's ultimately what, what again, uh, was responsible, I think, for, for uh, his, uh, his demise. Um, it, it, a couple of examples of, of the incredible change that, that Kennedy uh, 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 under, underwent. Uh, 
the Eisenhower administration had been very supportive of dictatorships throughout Latin America, providing them with enormous amounts of military assistance, uh, advice, uh, uh, support, intelligence support. And uh, Kennedy began reversing that. Uh, one, one good example is in the Dominican Republic, where uh, a military dictatorship was in control. And uh, Kennedy, Kennedy uh, looked at what was happening and demanded that a free election be held uh, and force the, the, uh, the military to, to, in fact, back down and have a free election. Uh, uh, and and a, a reformist uh, liberal was, was elected. Uh, but unfortunately, once Kennedy was, uh, was gone, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, reversed uh, that policy of, uh, of change in Latin America, of uh, uh, moving toward one of uh, supporting, supporting the poor and the underprivileged there. Uh, Kennedy instituted the, the Peace Corps, as you may know, and the, the Alliance for Progress, which were designed to, to help the, the poor of uh, Latin America. Uh, but those things faded also after his, uh, after his uh, demise. Um, Kennedy uh, initiated the Civil Rights uh, Act and, or, or legislation and, and the Voting Rights legislation that didn't pass during his, his presidency but which did, uh, was enacted uh, uh, by Lyndon Johnson uh, following that. Uh, Kennedy uh, uh, also assisted enormously in, in de-escalating the, the tension between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time. Um, uh, the Berlin Wall was a subject of, of great uh, 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 problems, uh, and uh, uh, Kennedy managed to, uh, to stave off a confrontation there between uh, American military forces and the Soviets on the other side. Uh, but I, I think the, the item that, that went the farthest that Kennedy most, uh, was most pleased about in terms of what he had accomplished was the a nuclear test ban uh, treaty, a treaty that still is in effect today, uh, unlike, unlike some of our nuclear agreements. Uh, uh, this one has held, and, uh, and it was a hallmark, I, I think, of, of Kennedy's hopes and, and aspirations for what was possible. Uh, in addition, Kennedy stood up to corporate, corporate America, as no uh, president I've ever uh, uh, known or heard about uh, has uh, done. Uh, Kennedy uh, demanded that U.S. Steel reverse its, uh, its price gouging. Uh, Kennedy uh, tried to uh, uh, pass the, uh, a, a, a piece of legislation regarding the, the, uh, the uh, oil depreciation allowance of, of large uh, energy corporations. Uh, so um, Kennedy was making all kinds of all kinds of changes. One of the most important was his commitment to withdraw from Vietnam. Most people are completely oblivious to this fact, uh, and it's it, it's unfortunate. You know, we, we have great public television, I think, in this country, but uh, uh, on occasion, uh, those people who were involved in that uh, are wrong, or for one reason or another, they 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 are in error in terms of what they, what they present. And the, the Vietnam uh, series, I think it's the, the most important, the, the most expensive, certainly, series that public television has ever done uh, by Ken Burns, uh, misrepresents uh, entirely uh, what Kennedy, uh, Kennedy accomplished, or was about to accomplish. Uh, Kennedy, of course, initially uh, w was a cold warrior going into office. Uh, he increased the troop level in, in Vietnam from 1,000 to about 16,000 uh, men over the course of his three years uh, as president. Uh, and, and he supported the military. He supported the CIA and its plans uh, for, for uh, uh, changing, changing uh, 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 governments uh, that were hostile to the United States. But, but he also uh, came to realize fairly quickly that uh, there were serious problems uh, in, with the agency. Uh, 
and, and the, uh, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, I think, was the, the first uh, in a long line of uh, uh, events that transformed Kennedy's thinking. Uh, at the Bay of Pigs, we had uh, about 1,400 exiles trained by the CIA. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, it was an Eisenhower administration uh, plan, program, that Kennedy accepted, uh, even though he was uh, skeptical uh, that it would, it would work. Uh, but he was assured by the CIA and the military chiefs, the Joint Chiefs, that, uh, that absolutely the Cuban people would rise up once the, uh, once the troops landed. And, and of course, uh, when they did land, they were, they were immediately uh, held on the beach. Uh, many of them were killed. And uh, the remaining force was, uh, was captured. Uh, so, so uh, Kennedy, um, uh, Kennedy was 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 uh, shocked, I think, by that by that development. Uh, that immediately brought the the head of the CIA and the Joint Chiefs to to Kennedy's office, and they demanded that American troops be sent in to save these uh, these heroic exiles. Uh, Kennedy refused. He refused to provide air cover that the, uh, the uh, Joint Chiefs wanted uh, and, and the Marines that the, uh, the uh, military wanted, uh, and, and later found out that the CIA knew that the, uh, that the Cuban government was aware of, of the coming attack and was prepared for, for the attack, and, and thus the, the exiles that hit the beach never had a, a chance of uh, success whatsoever. Uh, the plan was to, to get Kennedy then to uh, commit a full scale, to a full scale invasion of Cuba. Uh, and Kennedy was outraged by that. He, he subsequently fired uh, the head of the uh, CIA, Alan Dulles. He fired Dulles' uh, assistant director, uh, Charles Cabell. He fired uh, the, the head of the clandestine operations, Richard Bissell. And he fired, uh, eventually, the head of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Lyman Lemnitzer. Uh, Kennedy s said to his associates, you know, uh, I I've been betrayed by this organization, and, and I'm, I'm going to uh, smash it in a, in a thousand pieces. Uh, what he meant by that was he wanted to transform the CIA from, one of, uh, from an agency of covert operations to an agency of strict intelligence. Uh, activity only. Uh, so uh, 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 that was that was very important in his in his uh, uh, transformation, I would say. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, Vietnam, uh, as I said, Kennedy uh, Kennedy was. I really didn't get into that. I, I should have uh, proceeded to to explain uh, what what happened. Uh, Kennedy initially committed to uh, send more troops to Vietnam, but he came to realize that uh, Vietnam was an absolute lost cause, that there was no hope of success there, uh, even though he was an advocate for sending more troops in and, and supporting the, the efforts of the, uh, the pro-American government there. Uh, so he sent several fact-finding missions, one uh, led by Senator Mike Mansfield, the other by uh, uh, his defense secretary, Robert McNamara, and the head of the Joint Chiefs, the new head of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Maxwell Taylor. And, and they all came back with the same, with the same recommendations uh, based on the fact that this was a, a disaster that could, it was a war that could not be won under any circumstance. So Kennedy uh, moved uh, to, to completely alter uh, his, his previous position. He, on, in, on October 11th, 1963, signed a, what's called a National Security Memorandum that uh, uh, required immediate uh, beginning withdrawal from Vietnam of American forces and complete withdrawal of American forces by the, by the end of 1965. Uh, that was his position. It was clear. It was emphatic. The only reason it wasn't announced publicly was Kennedy was afraid that the public was not prepared for, for that kind of a change, and that would negatively impact his reelection uh, in the coming year. But once he was reelected, he said he, he's going absolutely full force 
to, to alter the, the course of events in, in Vietnam. Now, Burns, uh, Ken Burns says nothing whatsoever about that fact. He presents Kennedy as just one of a long line of presidents who, uh, who found themselves in something of a quagmire but, but couldn't find the, the will or the, the means to get out of that uh, situation. Kennedy did find the means, uh, and he was about to, uh, to act uh, on it. But unfortunately, his life was taken uh, uh, before he was able to, to move uh, uh, directly uh, to withdraw uh, from a, a commitment in Vietnam. We wouldn't have had a Vietnam War if, if John Kennedy had lived. Uh, uh, he was not like uh, Truman and Eisenhower or Johnson and, and Nixon who followed him. Uh, as, as Burns uh, maintains. Uh, I, think, I think maybe, maybe Burns was, was afraid of the, the, uh, the, the result of, of uh, uh, publicizing that, that fact, perhaps uh, you know, uh, concerned that the, uh, the public might, might try to connect that fact to his assassination. Of course, there is some relationship, but that was only one of uh, many reasons for his uh, for his assassination. Um, Kennedy, Kennedy's greatest accomplishment, however, was saving the world from nuclear war. And this, this occurred during the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in October of 62. Uh, the Russians uh, were placing ICBMs uh, with nuclear uh, capability uh, into Cuba. The CIA discovered uh, the placement of those missiles and, and immediately the CIA and the military uh, went to Kennedy and demanded that we take, take everything out and that we, uh, we in, invade Cuba and once and for all uh, eliminate Fidel Castro and the, the Soviet uh, presence there. Um, uh, the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, however, uh, proceeded. Uh, uh, the, the, his cabinet met with the CIA and, and with the uh, Joint Chiefs, uh, and uh, uh, there was extensive discussion about what to do. Uh, and, and in fact, the CIA and the Joint Chiefs convinced every member of his cabinet, and perhaps to some extent even, even Robert Kennedy, his brother, uh, that, that an invasion of Cuba was the, the course to take. And in the meantime, we had, uh, the Cubans had shot down an American plane, which added to the the uh, issue, uh, uh, but Kennedy refused. Kennedy was the only man in the room who stood his ground. I mean, one of the great books that I, I would recommend every student read is Profiles in Courage. I, I read it uh, uh, as an undergraduate, and uh, uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, and, and we can see that, that uh, begin to come through in, in Kennedy's ability to stand his ground despite overwhelming opposition and, uh, and odds. Uh, Kennedy stood his ground, refused to, uh, to opt for a military invasion of Cuba. Now, what we discovered some years later in the 1990s, uh, for the first time, it, it, it's quite remarkable. We had no, no indication uh, of, the, of the fact of the matter. Uh, what we discovered was that there were over 40,000 Russian troops in, uh, in Cuba at that time with a, a battery of almost 100 mid-range, middle, uh, medium-range uh, nuclear uh, missiles ready uh, to go, right? And uh, we, we know now, we found out in the 90s, that the uh, commander in charge of those missiles would have launched. He said absolutely emphatically, and we have the records to establish that he had the authority to do it to launch those missiles if there had been an American invasion of, uh, of Cuba. Uh, those missiles would have taken out probably a couple of hundred thousand Americans. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the response of the American government, I think, would have, have had to have been a nuclear uh, retaliation against the Soviet Union. Uh, and with that, uh, many experts or people who have studied the subject are of the opinion that perhaps 600 million people, they, I mean, this is not, this is not what, you, what you could say uh, is, is, a, uh, is a typical uh, event in the history of, uh, of this country. This is 
McNamara described as the most dangerous uh, event in, in, the, in the 19th century. And uh, I, I think it was. Uh, and we have only John F. Kennedy, only John F. Kennedy to thank for, for saving the world, in effect, from nuclear disaster. So, uh, so my conclusion is that uh, uh, Kennedy, Kennedy was one of the greatest presidents in, in the history of the, uh, of the country. Uh, had he lived, I think it would have been a, a very different world. We'll, we'll get into some of the things, that additional things that, that he did, but uh, it would have been a much uh, saner and, uh, and democratic and uh, peaceful and just uh, world. Um, I, I think I'll, uh, uh, I, I, I've gone through a number of uh, transitions in terms of uh, h how to present this. And there were really two parts to the, uh, to the story. One is the, the assassination itself. And that's the one that most people have focused on, almost everyone in fact is focused on, the events in Dallas on November 22nd. Uh, that's to me uh, very secondary in terms, of, in terms of the larger reality of who, uh, why, and, and how uh, the assassination uh, was accomplished. But uh, let's, uh, let's start, perhaps I'll, I'll try, to, try to get this uh, PowerPoint into the right spot. Um, let me go down the, uh, through these and uh, see where I, okay, here we go. Uh, so, so I'm gonna just, just focus on the, uh, on the events in, uh, uh, in Dallas. Uh, uh, Oh, I wanted to take a poll, that's right. <laughs> it's a good thing I have a few notes here. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd be curious to know how many people are of the opinion that there was a conspiracy to murder Kennedy? How many people uh, feel that uh, there was a single assassin? How many people just don't know? So let's start with a conspiracy. Okay, that's most, most everyone here. Uh, how about a single assassin? Uh, and, and the last option is uh, you don't know. Okay, quite a few people in that category as well. Hopefully I'll, I'll help you uh, make up your mind on the subject. Uh, th this was an incredibly complicated uh, and extensive plot. Uh, this was uh, something that, that took many, many months to, uh, to set up. And, uh, but, you know, the best uh, plans sometimes uh, are not quite perfect. Uh, the, the assassins uh, uh, missed two very important points, or things, developments, uh, items, if you will. The first was uh, a film that was made of uh, the entire a sequence of the assassination from start to finish uh, by a, a, an amateur uh, Photographer named Abraham Zapruder. Zapruder was just a few, a few yards away from the from the assassins, but some of the assassins. But uh, uh, he managed to to make this film without being detected, and the film actually survived, even though a lot of films have been were confiscated uh, at 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 the uh, at that time, immediately by uh, by who knows. Uh, in any event. Uh, uh, so we, we, we had a, uh, a recording of, of what happened from start to finish. What that indicated was that it took 5.6 seconds from the beginning, uh, from the first shot to the last shot, and that uh, uh, it provided information as to when uh, President Kennedy was hit and when John Connolly was hit by, by uh, different, different bullets. Uh, the next item that was extraordinarily important was the uh, Manlika Kakano uh, a rifle of, of Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, uh, now, the, the assassins, I, I think, uh, had no choice in, in the matter. I mean, the, Lee Harvey Oswald owned only one weapon, uh, or at least had one weapon uh, uh, that, that was registered, and that was this, uh, this outdated Italian uh, maybe uh, pre uh, pre World War II uh, 
a single, single uh, uh, bolt action uh, uh, weapon. It was, it was a terrible choice for an assassination, for sure. But uh, in, in any event, uh, the important point is that, is that it took 2.3 seconds to manually discharge a shell after firing and, and to move a shell into the firing chamber. 2.3 seconds, and that's without even aiming, right? So put that, put that uh, time in, in, in your mind and compare it to the uh, six seconds approximately of the assassination from start to finish. That meant the maximum, the absolute maximum number of shots you could have gotten off was three, right? And I think three is pushing, pushing it, pushing the envelope for sure, but three is possible. And, and it's been established that it's possible. But probably you wouldn't be able to aim very well uh, with, with having to get off three shots in that, in, in six seconds. Um, so the, um, the, the government was faced with a, with a uh, problem. Uh, two of the shots were accounted for. There was one shot that, uh, that, that took off most of Kennedy's head, the final shot. Uh, there was a, a shot that uh, hit a bystander down by the, the railroad uh, overpass. Uh, and so that left just one, one shot to do everything else, to do all of the wounds to uh, President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Uh, and and th that created a huge problem for the, for the government. Uh, I say here obvious hard evidence contradictions because this is this is physical evidence. You know, we, we have all kinds of speculation as to what happened, who was involved, his ideas. Oh, there was a guy in the sewer. There was a guy, a Secret Service guy, accidentally discharged his weapon. Uh, you have all kinds of speculations, but uh, but from my perspective, people should examine the hard evidence, the empirical data. Right? That's, that's where the, the real story can be confirmed and, and established, right? There are simply too many bullets. We have uh, bullets, uh, two, two bullets, not counting the, the headshot, two bullets uh, hitting, hitting John F. Kennedy. We have two bullets hitting uh, Governor Connolly, uh, although some argue there was only one. And, and we have a bullet hole in the windshield uh, of, the, of the vehicle as, as well. Uh, so all told, by my calculation, there had to be a seven, seven shots, right? Uh, and the maximum that was possible uh, by, by the, the hard physical evidence of the film and the, the rifle was three. Uh, there were too m many verifiable uh, shots. Uh, some years later, uh, acoustical technology developed to a point where uh, you could determine the location from which various uh, shots occurred. And uh, several uh, uh, analytical firms were employed to, to, to uh, determine that. And, and they discovered that there were at least four shots. And that it wasn't just four shots, at least four shots. And that at least one of the shots came from the grassy knoll in front of the Kennedy vehicle. Uh, there were too many different shot angles. You've got, uh, maybe I should go to the specifics of the, uh, of the PowerPoint at this, at this point. Let me see if I can, here we go. Here's Dealey Plaza. And uh, let me see if I can get my, my little clicker working here. Uh, Okay, so here's the book depository. That's the area in which Lee Harvey Oswald was alleged to have fired his weapon. Uh, this is the, uh, the grassy knoll over here that had a picket fence behind it. Uh, and the Zapruda film was, was right in here. Zapruda took his, his film, as I said, just a few yards away from, from the assassins. Uh, let me do the next one. Okay, this is another, uh, this is an actual picture of Dealey Plaza. And instead of the, uh, oops, 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 let me go back. Oh, gee. Uh, see, I'm not, I'm not familiar with this technology. I'm an old uh, paper and pencil guy, basically. Uh, 
Okay, here we, let me see if I can get this clicker going. Okay, so this is, this is uh, Houston Street, this is Elm Street. It would have been much easier, the, the motorcade came up here and then it would have been much easier to just go straight directly to the underpass, but instead it went up uh, to Elm Street and then proceeded this way, thus uh, making it possible to, uh, to assassinate uh, the president. Uh, let me see, next slide. Okay, this is a diagram of the various shots that, uh, that hit Governor Connolly and, and Kennedy. There was one shot at a, from a 90 degree angle that hit Kennedy in the back, uh, exited supposedly, this, according to the Warren Commission report, the government's uh, report, that uh, it hit Kennedy uh, six inches below, below his neckline, then somehow managed to turn around uh, and uh, proceed upward at about a 45 degree angle, exit his throat, and then proceed to uh, stay in, in midair for 1.6 seconds. We know that from the Zapruda film, the point at which Kennedy grabs his throat and the point at which Governor Conley grimaces. It's 1.6 seconds between those two events. Uh, Governor Conley is then hit uh, in his, the back of his right arm uh, broke, breaks the bullet, breaks a couple of ribs, and then supposedly uh, uh, destroys his wrist, or a good part of his wrist, and somehow lodges itself from his right hand wrist into his left thigh, uh, where it magically falls out uh, at, the, uh, at Parkland Hospital, almost, almost intact and in a pristine uh, form. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, and it's incredible to me. Uh, the more I've looked at this, the, the more incredible it becomes. How in heaven's name were the American public sold this, this nonsense? It was, it was sheer and utter nonsense. But it was Joe McCarthy established uh, uh, some years uh, before uh, John F. Kennedy's presidency. If you say something often enough uh, and, and push it uh, with, with great, uh, great uh, uh, commitment, uh, uh, in time, people will accept, uh, come to accept uh, uh, the most absurd notions uh, possible uh, about things. Uh, and and that's, that's what happened. And let me just say that, that uh, the media, I think, played something of a, of, a, of a significant role in all of this, too, and has over the years. And I don't want to knock the media too, uh, too severely because I think most of what the media does is, is very, very objective, very, very reasonable uh, and, and accurate. Uh, this is another, another uh, diagram that I made up. And, and as you can see, it, 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 it makes the whole thing absurd uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, angles, in terms of numbers of shots. Uh, it just it would have been impossible to happen as it did. This is a picture of, of Kennedy's uh, coat. Uh, six inches below the neckline is, is the, the entry wound. Uh, it's two to three millimeters in size. It's a typical rifle entry wound. Uh, and the next shot is also an entry wound. Uh, that, and this is, this is a depiction that at least six of the, the doctors at Parkland Hospital who examined the president when he arrived uh, stated uh, was the case, right? This is an entry wound also about the same size, two to three uh, millimeters uh, in size. And here we have uh, the throat wound post-surgery. The, the story becomes incredible, and maybe that's one reason why the critics have not been uh, believed to the fullest extent because it seems so fantastical that, that the government could have, or elements in the government, we don't want to accuse the entire government, but elements of the government uh, could have gone to the extent, to the length that they did to, uh, to uh, uh, establish that there was a single assassin or firing from the rear. This is designed to, to uh, indicate that that the throat wound was an exit wound, right? It's about uh, 10 to 15 times larger than the, than the entry wound or originally. But there was a, a pre-autopsy 
autopsy, in effect, that took place just before the, the, uh, the official autopsy on, on Kennedy's uh, uh, body. Uh, and and the, the people involved uh, had, to, had to do things to his head, they had to do things to his throat, so as to make it appear that, uh, that all of the shots came from the rear. This is an incredible shot that, or uh, frame from the Zapruder film. Uh, and it, it's, it's a result of Robert Groden's great work enhancing and enlarging uh, those frames. Here you see, it, it's kind of difficult to see, actually. Let me see if I put down the lights, how that would, would work. Do I have to turn all of these down? I guess I do. Okay, maybe you can see this better. But right here is an incredible protuberance. It's like a volcano ready to burst, right? And that's, that's the bullet coming through from the front of his head uh, and, and about ready to explode uh, out the back. Uh, okay, now we turn on the, these lights. Uh, next shot. These are four of the doctors, of which there were nine at Parkland Hospital, all attesting to the fact that there was a huge gaping wound in the back of Kennedy's head larger than the size of a, of a baseball. Every one of them, nine uh, total. There was a nurse, there were, there were witnesses, uh, there were medical technicians who handled his body, his body. Every one of them who examined uh, Kennedy's head talked about this, this huge wound to the, the back of his head. Here we have additional doctors and a nurse uh, who, who saw that. And here we have witnesses uh, near the Kennedy vehicle at the time who say the same thing. And here is a diagram that Dr. Uh, Robert McClellan uh, made of what he saw uh, as one of, the, one of the participating doctors at Parkland Hospital. Uh, this is a, a diagram made by a fellow named Paul O'Connor, one of the medical technicians, of what he saw. Uh, this is not an entry wound. Uh, in a million years, it couldn't have been an entry wound, but it looked like an, ent uh, an entry wound uh, when the, when the uh, uh, practitioners got through changing things uh, to the head. It looks something like an entry wound anyway. Uh, so the Warren Commission came up with this, this diagram initially uh, trying to represent uh, the two shots to, to Kennedy's back. Uh, and notice how high up that they have moved the uh, the uh, shot to the back, six inches below the, the neckline. And here it's right on the neckline, completely fictitious. And here we have the so-called bullet going into his head from the, from the rear. That, th th that didn't fly at all. And so the, the, uh, the Warren Commission came up with, it with pictures, forged fake pictures. And, and this one, you, there's, there's no wound discernible at all, in, except a little hole uh, that you barely can see there in the, in the top of his head. Uh, and this uh, was alleged to be uh, the, the actual uh, photograph of, uh, of Kennedy's head at the time of the autopsy. Both the, the individual who did the op, who uh, uh, was responsible for taking the pictures uh, at the autopsy and, and the individual responsible for taking the x-ray testified some years later. They had to wait some years for fear, I suppose, of consequences. But they, they both uh, testified, held a press conference and said, the pictures they took were not the pictures that the government presented to the public. Um, and here we have some additional enhancements uh, done by Robert Groden of, of actual, we assume, assassins. This fellow is situated over at the far end of the sixth floor of the book depository. Uh, it, it isn't a very good picture, but it, it was the best uh, that, that was possible, uh, but, but it, it indicates that there was more than one individual up there on the sixth floor of the book depository at the time of the assassination. This is a frame from the, uh, from the Zapruda film itself. Here you see the back of the head of an assassin behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll that, that people looking at the film initially completely missed, but was picked up some years later. And uh, here is an incredible picture, Mary Mormon's uh, photograph that was enhanced uh, many years later uh, that, that gives you 
an image of someone who looked like a police officer uh, at the exact moment uh, firing his, his, his shot, the last shot that was a, an explosive uh, bullet, uh, an explosive shot to uh, Kennedy's, Kennedy's head. Let me say also, compare the, uh, the pinpoint uh, entry wounds to the, to the, uh, to the shot that, that killed the president ultimately. I mean, it, it's, it's night and day. Uh, there were two different kinds of, kinds of bullets. And sure as heck, Lee Harvey Oswald, who's alleged to have done it all, didn't just change his, his, uh, his bullets, putting in an explosive bullet at the end and, and not, not uh, having an explosive bullet uh, for the first two shots. I mean, it, it, it's, it's fantastical. Uh, OK, so I think that's the, oh, uh, one more. This is, this is the assassin of the assassin. Uh, Jack Ruby. Uh, Jack Ruby is everywhere uh, at the time of the assassination. He's down uh, in the front of the uh, Dallas uh, uh, Book Depository. Uh, we, we, from, the, from the recent uh, disclosure dump of, of documents, uh, we, we know Jack Ruby, uh, an FBI informant, was right next to Jack and a friend of Jack's. And, and the Warren Commission refused to include his, his testimony in, in its report. Uh, but it just came out this, this last year uh, that the, this, this uh, item was, was presented to the public. Jack Ruby, there, there at, at the very site of the assassination, uh, said to this fellow, are you ready for the fireworks before the assassination went down, right? Jack Ruby is, is all over the police station the, the day Oswald is brought in. People want to know, who is this assassin? So the chief of police talks to the FBI, talks to everyone in Washington, and, and gives a press conference that night. And the chief says, oh, Lee Harvey Oswald was, uh, was active in New Orleans with the Free Cuba Committee. Uh, and lo and behold, up in the back of the room is this innocent nightclub owner, right, supposedly, who says, no, chief. It was a fair play for Cuba committee, which in fact was the case. That was very, a very important point because uh, the fair play for Cuba committee was the pro-Castro committee, right? And they wanted to associate Oswald with Castro, not have Oswald working for uh, the free Cuba committee, which was an anti-Castro uh, group. Uh, there was something else about uh, Jack Ruby that I I think, oh, I, I know, it's the, the Warren Commission said it looked everywhere to try to find evidence of an alleged as as association with the, the mob uh, that, that some people claimed that Jack Ruby had. Well, it, it didn't look very, very far because if they looked in the front page of the Chicago Tribune uh, some years earlier, they would have seen a picture of Jack Ruby on the front page where he was charged with the, the murder of the union leader uh, uh, Leon uh, White. Uh, he, he managed to, uh, to evade that, that, uh, that uh, uh, prosecution, or the prosecution failed. But in any event, this guy is a mobster from day one, from start to finish. He, he was running guns, he was running drugs, he was running uh, girls in, in Dallas. Uh, everyone knew he was a mobster, except evidently the, the Warren uh, group the Warren Commission. Uh, OK, next slide. Now I'm, I'm going to uh, try to get back to uh, the important stuff. This is the first part of the presentation. Hopefully, I've, I've convinced you that, uh, that the, the, the Warren Commission story uh, was a fictitious one. Uh, but uh, uh, these documents will help, I think, if you pick them up afterward. Uh, to, to determine what the, the truth, in fact, uh, is. Now, let me see what I've got here. What happened? No, I'm not going to do that one uh, yet. OK. Uh, let me see if I can just, oh, no, wrong one. Oh. OK. Uh, we just exit, and then we go up here to the top. How do I get to the top here? I 
guess I gotta bring this, bring this up. Okay. Here. Okay. I think this is the, the next one. Uh, as I said, I, I've been changing the order continuously. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, but I, I think I think as a historian, historians try to understand the reasons why uh, uh, people believe as they do and, and things uh, occur as they as they do. Um, I, I think we were undergoing an incredible anti-communist hysteria in this period of 1945 to 1970. Um, World War II had an enormous impact on the psyche of Americans. I, I think it, you can actually can take it, take it back to the colonial period to some extent. It's a little bit of a stretch, but in any event, the Puritans, who were very important in our early history, uh, saw themselves as God's chosen people. They saw themselves as involved in a great mission to, uh, to change the world and to make the world a better place. Uh, that subsequently, I think, morphed into the manifest destiny ideal of the 19th century, where the, the, the position was, the, the, the idea in America was that, that God was behind, behind this country and responsible for all that we did, and that it was our destiny, it was our destiny to expand across the continent and then to spread the American value system to the rest of the world and, and our influence uh, to the rest of the world and uh, uh, to make the world a, a, a much better place uh, as, as a result. Uh, so here we were, the end of the Second World War, Europe is in shambles, Asia is absolutely devastated. Uh, there are tens of millions of dead uh, nothing is standing in much of Europe. Nothing is standing in much of China. Uh, and the, what's happening in the United States? Our economy is booming, right? The war gave the economy an enormous uh, boost. Jobs were plentiful. Uh, prosperity was, was increasing. Uh, uh, half of all the production in the world in 1946 was from the United States. Uh, Two-thirds of all of the investment capital was in the United States. This was to be our century. This was to be our time. We had arrived from the perspective of, of uh, many Americans, most Americans. I think they saw us as, as winning the war, even though the Russians had, had played an enormous role and took most of the beating in, in the Second World War. Uh, as well as the, the Chinese. The Chinese claim they lost when I was in Beijing. Uh, they were telling me that they lost uh, maybe as many as 60 million people. Well, I think that's an exaggeration, but they lost probably many more than the Russians, in fact, probably 40 million people, all told, uh, in the war. So, uh, so all of a sudden, here were, here were socialists and communists winning elections in Europe, in France and, and uh, uh, Italy especially, uh, and, and communists uh, waging revolution in Asia, in Vietnam, and in China, uh, and then China, the largest country in the world, going communist. Americans said to themselves, what in heaven's name is happening? How can this be? This is our century. We won the war, and now we have all these communists uh, all over the place, uh, taking over governments or in the process of, of doing that. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the American uh, government swung into action with the CIA at the, at the vanguard. Uh, uh, interventions into other countries became standard operating procedure. In the Truman administration, there were approximately 50. In the Eisenhower administration, CIA uh, interventions went up to something like 180. And even in the Kennedy administration, they were, they were close to that number, even though uh, he only was, was president for three years. Uh, uh, so uh, the CIA was incredibly active, incredibly important, incredibly powerful, and uh, everywhere, sabotaging, uh, assassinating, uh, overthrowing governments, uh, uh, supporting gr um, 
guerrilla movements that were pro-American capitalist in orientation, uh, uh, funding operations of these groups, uh, paying off officials in these countries. Uh, Americans complain about the Russians interfering in, in our elections, while the CIA was very active in interfering in, in a lot of uh, foreign elections. Not only, not only did they interfere in those elections, they were overturning some of the most democratic governments in the world, right? Uh, Venezuela had an extremely reformist uh, government elected by the people of that country. Uh, that uh, government was, was uh, overturned by the, by the CIA, its intervention. Uh, same thing in Brazil, another elected government overturned by the CIA and its, its, uh, its, its practitioners, its supporters. Uh, and, and in 1970-72, uh, Chile as well, another elected government. The biggest issue, I think, for the CIA that moved it to intervene in those countries was, number one, land reform, right? Uh, in those countries where governments were trying to improve the lot of the poor and the, the peasant population by way of uh, uh, providing them with land, uh, that those things were seen as communist in nature, led by a communist idea or involving a communist idea, sharing the wealth. Uh, the, the other problem the CIA had was uh, the, uh, the expropriation of the property of American corporations, such as uh, occurred, for instance, in the case of Iran. Iran. Iran had the most democratic Muslim government in the Middle East. It was totally democratic. It had an incredibly reformist uh, leader, uh, Mossadegh at the time, in power. Uh, but the problem in Iran was that the Iranian government wanted to control its own oil. Can you imagine such an outrageous thing? It must be a communist-led uh, uh, or, or influenced uh, uh, plot, obviously. And so the CIA organized a uh, coup d'etat there, uh, and uh, uh, subsequently we had a, a brutal uh, dictatorship, but a dictatorship that was totally capitalist oriented, pro American, and, uh, and uh, uh, that led to a, 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 the reaction of, of Muslims who became extremists. And, and overturned that, that dictatorship in 19, 1980. Uh, and Iran then became you know, one of the most, was the most extremist Muslim uh, countries in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think it is today, but uh, in any event, that's the origin, in effect, of the conflict between the United States and the government uh, and the people of Iran. Um, so the CIA was everywhere. The CIA tried to assassinate the uh, leader of China, Cho Enlai, uh, failed in that attempt. We, we, uh, we were involved in the assassination of uh, Sukarno in, in Indonesia, of uh, Nkrumah in, in Ghana, of uh, other uh, African leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't just the CIA that was involved in, in these, these kinds of uh, nefarious activities. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, uh, FBI uh, was planting its, its people in, in peace organizations and, and black uh, civil rights groups uh, and black activists. Some of them, I guess you could uh, call uh, activists rather than strictly civil rights oriented. But in any event, uh, the FBI was active in those things and, and uh, I think some of the assassinations of black leaders, such as the assassination of Fred Hampton in Chicago, uh, directly linked to, uh, to, the, to the FBI. Uh, so we were, we were worried, though. We were, we were uh, a lot of extremists, especially, were, were uh, concerned incredibly about the, the, uh, the criticism that was developing in, in, in a lot of places in this country in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, so they, they tried to counter that by, by initiating actions uh, to stop those, those developments. Uh, and uh, those actions took many forms. Before, in the 1950s, we had had the HUAC, House on american Activities Committee, the, uh, the Joe McCarthy hearings, uh, in which uh, 
government employees, especially in the State Department, were charged with being communists or influenced by communists and, and run out of their positions. The whole uh, China section of the State Department was gutted uh, with uh, supposed communists uh, uh, who were fired by, by uh, as a result of McCarthy's uh, hearings. Uh, in fact, <laughs> This is a very, this may be the first time that I've, I've expressed this, but even here at North Shore Community College, we had, uh, when I arrived here in 1967, uh, I gave a presentation on uh, the Vietnam War, uh, which was very critical to be sure of the war, uh, to a group of visiting students from Argentina. Uh, so I, I get a call from the dean of the college uh, who, uh, I, I thought he was going to congratulate me on this wonderful presentation. The students loved it, by the way. Uh, so I, I go into his office. He said, I'll, I'll never forget, he's pounding his fist, actually, saying, you know, I have it on good authority that you're either a communist or a communist sympathizer, and if it's the last thing I ever do as dean of this college, I'm going to see you out of here, right? Well, that was 51 years ago. <laughs> And I'm still standing, maybe just barely, but, uh, but I'm, I'm still standing, and he's gone, and uh, uh, in any event. But it was, it was a period of real hysteria. I mean, people were looking. I remember when I was in Texas, families were disowning their children because they were involved in anti-war activities against the Vietnam War. There was one, one friend I had whose brother get up in high school and denounced his brother as, as being a, a, you know, a communist because he was opposed to the Vietnam War. Um, it was an awful time to, to be an activist, to be involved in criticism of anything important in this, uh, in this country. Uh, and those who lived through that period, I think, know something of, of what I'm speaking. Um, So in, in that context, along comes John F. Kennedy. Oh my gosh, look at the time. It's almost 1 o'clock. I was afraid this would, would happen. Uh, so I'm going to have to, oh gee. Um, tw what am I saying? 12. My, my, I, I haven't set my clock back. <laughs> I'm really on top of things, i, I got to tell you. Oh my gosh. OK. So. Uh, in any event, we're supposed to be out of here in, in another 15 or 20 minutes. But, uh, but it's in this context that, that John Kennedy arrives as uh, President of the United States. Let me see if I, I can get this going again. Uh, and uh, let me see. Book register. So uh, as I said, Kennedy came into office as a cold warrior. Uh, I mentioned the Bay of Pigs fiasco that began to get Kennedy thinking that maybe the CIA uh, and the military were a real problem. The SIOP 62 plan, very important. I'll bet no one here has ever heard of that, right? This was a plan of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, right, as well as the CIA. Uh, they brought it to Kennedy in July of 1961. This, my friends, was a plan to do a preemptive nuclear attack on the Soviet Union in late 1963. Kennedy asked, well, why wait till late 63? Dulles said to Kennedy, he says, we, we, we need time to uh, develop more nuclear weapons. We want so many nuclear weapons that we'll be able to annihilate, annihilate, obliterate completely the Soviet Union without having to suffer a serious retaliatory uh, attack on the United States. Uh, Kennedy was absolutely aghast. Uh, one of the generals involved in the, in the uh, which I say, proselytizing for this plan was a fellow named Thomas uh, Power, who was the uh, head of Strategic Air Command. And he's alleged to have said, and this is documented in a number of places, uh, he's alleged to have said, what is all this talk about civilian deaths? He said, look, at the end of a nuclear war, 
if there are two Americans and one Russian standing, we win. I mean, that's the, the kind of extremist, uh, uh, almost psychosis, I think you could say, that, that pervaded some segments of, of uh, our, our military uh, and our CIA as well. Uh, the, there was a Berlin Wall tank confrontation. I briefly uh, referred to that previously. Kennedy, Kennedy demanded that the general withdraw American tanks from the wall. Uh, the Joint Chiefs, it's like these guys just, just wouldn't stop. They were hell-bent on, on uh, taking out the Soviet Union. You, you have to understand that there was this idea that the Soviet Union was the repository of all evil in the world. They were leading a, a communist worldwide conspiracy to take over the world, to enslave Americans, to destroy the United States government as it currently was, was, uh, was established, uh, and to, to make, make uh, the world a communist, uh, a communist entity. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, extremist uh, uh, ideas like that led to persistence. The Joint Chiefs wanted to launch a, a full-scale invasion of Laos. There was a guerrilla movement there uh, led by communists. And Kennedy said no. What Kennedy did, he worked through uh, the parties involved and worked out a neutralist solution that held where all of the agreed parties came together and formed a coalition government. It's like, that's the way that the differences should be resolved rather than by, by abrupt military invasions and, and attacks and uh, activities. Uh, Operation Northwoods, oh my god. This is, I mean, probably some of you are saying, where the hell did this guy get all this, <laughs> right? I mean, he's gotta be, he's gotta be left uh, <laughs> beyond belief. Uh, Northwoods. This is a plan, another plan of the CIA, Joint Chiefs and the CIA together. This was presented by William Craig uh, to, to Kennedy, but <laughs> totally supported by Dulles and, and the Joint Chiefs. Uh, so there were three parts to the plan. Number one, we should, we should destroy boats coming from Cuba going to the United States with, uh, with fleeing uh, immigrants. Uh, second, we should blow up uh, some of the facilities at Guantanamo, which was a large uh, American military base. Guantanamo still is, in fact, in Cuba. Uh, but the, the option that, that, the, uh, that the chiefs liked, liked most was the idea of taking down an American, civilian American airliner, right, and blaming it on Castro, blaming all of those things on Fidel Castro, so as to move the American public to uh, support a full-scale invasion of Cuba, to take out this communist, take out the communist uh, presence of the Soviets forever from that uh, island just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. Kennedy couldn't believe it. He walked out of the room. At that point, Kennedy uh, and his brother, Robert, decided that, this, that the chiefs and the CIA were out of control, that this thing was headed to serious and significant uh, confrontation that he wouldn't be able to control on his own, right? And so he opened up a back channel to uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the, uh, the, the head of uh, government in the Soviet Union, through a, uh, an intermediary in the Russian embassy by the name of Gorgi Bolshakov, uh, who just happened to be also a KGB agent which is all the CIA needed, you know, to, uh, <laughs> to be convinced that, that the Kennedy uh, brothers were engaged in, in treason against the United States. Uh, and that's uh, what it came down to, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the CIA uh, spy chief, uh, James Angleton, discovered the back channel. They, they, they put a tap on the Kennedy's phones, both uh, Robert and and uh, John, uh, and they discovered that multiple classified top secret disclosures were being made to, uh, to the Russians uh, by the Kennedys. Uh, specifically, we, we have in, in the documents, or I wish we had actually in the documents, the 68 pages of telephone transcripts.
between uh, the Kennedys and, and the, their intermediaries and, and uh, Khrushchev uh, in, in Moscow. But uh, we know of at least two uh, disclosures. One had to do with the fact that Kennedy told uh, Khrushchev, uh, because Khrushchev was very, the Russians knew that a lot of this stuff was occurring, and, and they were uh, scared to death of the consequences themselves. Uh, so Kennedy, uh, Kennedy told uh, uh, Khrushchev that um, he did not have to worry regarding the Berlin uh, Wall, that the United States would not challenge that. Uh, in addition, uh, he disclosed uh, some of the specifics of the Northwoods plan to, uh, to uh, uh, get the, the public to support a full-scale invasion of Cuba. Uh, and of course, that was all the, the, the CIA needed. And, and the Cuban Missile Crisis that occurred in October of 1962 uh, confirmed uh, the CIA's fears to an even greater extent that, uh, that Kennedy was uh, in, a communist at heart, or at least a communist sympathizer, and trying to subvert the, the government of the United States uh, here at home. Um, the CIA then consulted with the highest ranking uh, United States government officials uh, and uh, to show them what, in fact, they had in terms of evidence. Look, uh, for years I, I said to myself, uh, how in heaven's name uh, could you have ever gotten so many people supportive of an assassination of, of a president of the United States, in this case, one of our greatest presidents? Well, they had documents. They spent six months uh, on, these, on these transcripts, right? And they, they showed them to J. Edgar Hoover. They showed them to uh, the Joint Chiefs, most specifically Lyman uh, Lemnitzer and, and uh, Curtis LeMay. Uh, and uh, they showed them to Lyndon Johnson. And, and this, this becomes, I, I talked to someone the other day, and, and he said, uh, who, who was behind this, this uh, assassination? And, and I said, well, you know, uh, the CIA put it together, uh, but they, they got the agreement of Lyndon Johnson to proceed, and Lyndon Johnson became a key to the, to the uh, plan by virtue of the fact that he would be president after Kennedy was removed from office. Uh, and it would be up to him to investigate what had happened. And, and so without his support, uh, this thing would have been dead in the water. It never would have gotten off the ground. For years, I found that impossible as, a, as, a, as an idea. I mean, how could uh, the President of the United States be in league with uh, the murder of a, with people who were murdering uh, one of the greatest presidents we've ever had? of this country. And, uh, uh, but the documents speak for themselves. The documents speak for themselves. Each of these uh, groups and individuals didn't directly uh, communicate with, the, with the, uh, the CIA. There was an organization put together uh, consisting of James Angleton, the head of the uh, clandestine uh, part of the CIA, uh, Robert Crowley, who was the deputy uh, and he did most of the organization uh, on site. And then, then uh, uh, another fellow whose name has uh, eluded me as well. Uh, and I have one, one of the documents in here is a 17-page synopsis of meetings, of communications, uh, phone calls, uh, and, and substantive uh, uh, subjects that were discussed. There's about 150 specific uh, uh, meetings and conferences and, and calls that were made to various people uh, to put this all together. Over a period of nine months, the CIA decided in March of 63 uh, that uh, Kennedy had to go. And uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of, you had to get everyone uh, coordinated everyone uh, uh, on board, uh, and it was not an easy thing to do. But uh, 
but they, uh, they put it together. And, uh, and uh, the documents speak for themselves, right? Uh, this is not, and, and let, let me just say that uh, uh, for years I, I said to myself uh, that, uh, that we continue to just, just flounder speculating, this speculating that, as to who, who did it in fact. Uh, to me, the, uh, the, the Warren Commission was absurd and not, not even uh, of great importance. I wanted to know uh, specifically who, who were the principals. And uh, uh, I, I thought that probably it will only occur uh, when some of the most important figures uh, are on their deathbeds and uh, when they decide to, to release uh, this information. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, 45 years later, approximately 50 years later, uh, some of the principals, uh, in fact, uh, uh, were on their deathbeds and w confirmed each other's uh, story. But most importantly, in the case of Robert Crowley, he produced documents. He gave them to Gregory Douglas, who was an editor of a military magazine. The both of them had a great interest in Nazis. Right, interestingly. Uh, and that's what brought them together and that's what, what uh, they, they found in common. Uh, and, and some have asked, well, why would Crowley, why would Crowley ever, ever uh, disclose this, this information? I, I think from Crowley's perspective, he was a great patriot. Robert Crowley believed he had saved the United States from communist takeover, right? Uh, and he, he felt he felt that he was not appreciated, and he, he as a good friend and colleague uh, also to James Angleton, he felt that Angleton had been run out of the CIA uh, uh, um, un unjustifiably. Right, that Angleton was also a great patriot who deserved uh, applause rather than condemnation. Uh, and uh, so uh, you, you've got to understand where these people were at and where they were coming from, I think, to, to understand why uh, documents would have been saved. Uh, Crowley was not willing to uh, publish these documents himself. He gave some of them to, uh, to uh, Douglas. Uh, after his death, the Crowley family provided additional documents to uh, Douglas. And uh, uh, there's one document in particular uh, called a zipper document, which runs 98 pages. Uh, that includes the, the synopsis of 17 pages of those meetings over nine months in the CIA. Uh, but missing are the transcripts. And I, I tried to get in touch with, uh, with Douglas but uh, wasn't able to, I, I got an email six months after I sent my initial email out and saying, you know, that his, his location was unknown and his uh, whereabouts were unknown. Uh, so uh, he's out there hopefully still uh, with those documents. Uh, there was also some pictures. The CIA had an additional backup, uh, which was that, that Kennedy, uh, uh, they had Kennedy in compromising positions uh, with, with uh, women. But Kennedy w was, you know, womanizing. And uh, uh, they, I think, had that as a backup in case you couldn't sell the, the, uh, the assassination on the basis of treason. You could sell it perhaps on the basis of, of this man being totally uh, immoral beyond, the, uh, beyond belief. Uh, so, I, I didn't get to everything, even close to everything that I wanted to, uh, to do, but uh, here we are at 1.15. I'm sorry, 12.15. <laughs> I gotta set this, this watch. Uh, So, so I'm, I'm sorry that we, we don't have time for, for questions. I'd be willing to take a few questions if, uh, if, if you have them, perhaps, if a few people want to stay around uh, for a little while. Uh, yeah, Tom.
Don't forget these documents, by the way. Yeah, put them out. Excuse me, Tom. Ah. One is Kennedy's brother, who was the, the Attorney General at the time, ah. and was privy to, I suppose, most information okay. in the country. And the okay. other... Your, your question is what? Why, why didn't the family... Just a minute. I'm getting to it. <laughs> These two key people who must have known all about all this stuff, Robert Kennedy and, and Ted Kennedy, where are they? Okay. That's one of the best questions uh, on the subject. Uh, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, yeah, the, the question is uh, that the Kennedy brothers knew, must have known uh, about, about much of this, and why didn't they, they challenge the, uh, the, the position of the, of the government on the subject? I, I think it, it comes down to uh, a couple of points. One is, one is that, uh, that there, was, there was clearly a cl uh, skeleton in, in, in John F. Kennedy's closet that, that the family preferred uh, not be made public. Uh, second, I, I think the, uh, the family wanted to retain this, this image of uh, Camelot and, and the great success that uh, Kennedy had been uh, as President of the United States. And third, I think, is the incredible uh, power of, of these organizations, of the CIA, of the military, and remember, Lyndon Johnson who was a principal in the, in the assassination, uh, was president of the United States. Johnson would have fought tooth and nail uh, to, to stop any kind of uh, uh, questioning of, of what had happened. Uh, so I, I, think, I think that's the best answer I could give you on the subject. Yeah. Why haven't there been a investigation right now by, say, a spotlight crew? are a crew in Washington. The country would want to know this. Where is, so if this is true, I'm just assuming what you're saying is true. Why isn't it on the front page of some national um, publication? Well, that, that, again, that's, a, that's an incredibly important question, too. And I've, I've thought a little bit about that. Uh, I, I think, number one, this is incredibly troubling. I, it's troubling to me, and I'm a, I've been a critic, you know, of a lot of things all my life. But uh, uh, to, to, to come to grips with, with such a, a, a radical uh, reality, I think, is extraordinarily difficult. This would, this would shake up this country, I, I think, if, in fact, it became quite the, the idea of uh, the government, the CIA, the military, Lyndon Johnson, uh, being involved in the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. It would uh, shake uh, I, up this country to the core, I think. It would be very problematic, too, uh, in terms of things like uh, the economy. Certainly, politically, it would be incredibly uh, traumatic. Uh, and then again, these people are not going to just sit there and let this happen. They're going to fight tooth and nail to stop any kind of challenge, right? They've been incredibly successful to date in this regard. Uh, the, the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination in 1913, uh, 2013, uh, NOVA. is a wonderful public television uh, entity, right? They've done wonderful things. But on the Kennedy assassination, they have failed horribly, right? NOVA has become full in full support of the Warren Commission position in that 2013 documentary. It's, they, the magic bullet theory, uh, has the name has been changed. It's now called the tumbling bullet. Uh, it supposedly tumbles uh, through the body and uh, hitting bone and so forth, it moves in different directions. But they brought in scientists. If you pay people enough money, they will do what you want them to do, right? They're like lawyers. I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid, right? Uh, with the right price, you can buy any kind of testimony you want, right? And unfortunately, I think that's what's happened. Uh, and and it's, it's a little difficult for me to understand and certainly to accept. But I think that's the, that's the reality we're, we're faced with. Harry, I think we have one more question. Oh, sure. H hello. Um, so the people that were 
conspiring to kill him, and so they, they hired like Lee Oswald to do it. I mean, if, I would think that they would be proud, the people that were trying to kill, kill Kennedy, if they killed him, instead of keeping it quiet. All, I mean, it's 55 years. Well, well, in, in, in fact, they, they didn't keep it quiet. I mean, it, the whole story became one of Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly uh, murdering the president all by himself without any assistance from anyone else. And that's been the standard position of, of the establishment, I think, for all these years. Very unfortunately, public opinion has changed for the worse uh, in the last uh, 20 years. In, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, up until 2001, something in the order 81%, 80%, 81% of the public believed there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. That now has, has moved down to only 61% of, of the public. And so uh, we're losing it. Uh, the idea that if, with enough time, you know, the truth will, will be known uh, seems to not be, be holding in, in this case at all. And uh, I, I think some of it has to do with the media. The, very interestingly, the one group, the one group that is most supportive of the uh, Warren Commission position that believes there was a single assassin that assassinated uh, President Kennedy. Most people would say, well, it's probably the, uh, the, the least educated, right? The, uh, the uh, uh, high school dropout. Wrong. It's college educated whites, American whites, right? There's, in only that demographic is there a majority of, of that population that believes that, that the Warren Commission position is, is in fact the case. Now, you have to ask, why is that the case? Why, why would college-educated people, who should be the, the most aware, the most rational uh, regarding these things, why would they, they believe that? And uh, another a writer by the name of Lowen has, has, I think, explained it. The same thing happened in, v in the Vietnam issue. Too. The college-educated public were the most supportive of the Vietnam War, right? And from Lowen's perspective, and I think applying it here as well, it's probably because uh, college-educated people identify themselves with the establishment, right? With people at the top of the socioeconomic political power uh, spectrum. So uh, that's. That's the best I can do in the way of offering an explanation to it all. Okay, I guess we've got to leave. Uh, thank you so much for coming.